All right. Well, hello and welcome to this LNN session. Uh, my name is Franz Gabriel. I'm a lecturer in education at the University of South Australia. And I'm one of the LANN coordinators. The Learning Analytics Learning Network, or LANN, is an international community of practice. And our network consists of students, faculty, staff, and practitioners who have a shared interest in learning analytics. And our activities serve both as an introduction to methods for new members of the field and as continuing education for existing members of the research workforce. And all of our sessions are made available on our website, and I will share um, the web address in the chat box in a minute. And you can check, check out our upcoming events on the website, and you can also follow us on Twitter. I'll also share a link to our Twitter account in a second. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Negin Mihirai from the University of South Australia and Professor Yelena Jovanovic from the University of Belgrade. They will be talking about video-based learning analytics. And note that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the session. And I will now hand it over to them. So Negin and Yelena, over to you. Thanks, Florence. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're from. Um, I'm in South Australia in Adelaide, where it's uh, just past four o'clock in the afternoon. So um, great to be here with you today um, and with my esteemed colleague, Yelena, um, to talk to you about video-based learning analytics and the research in this field. Um, I have been doing research in video, video-based learning and video analytics um, for over five years now, uh, looking at um, how students and learners of various types um, engage with video. And through this session, we'll be exploring some of those studies. But I'll just hand over to Yelena quickly to introduce herself. OK, thanks, Negin. Uh, OK, so hello, everyone. And uh, yeah, so my name is Yelena Ivanovic, and uh, I'm calling uh, from Belgrade, from Serbia, Europe. Uh, so I'm a professor here at University of Belgrade, uh, and uh, I teach here in the Department of Software Engineering. And um, as, uh, as a researcher, you know, I'm, for, of course, primarily in learning analytics and uh, primarily focused on self-regulated learning in higher education, lifelong learning settings. And related to that, uh, when it comes to video analytics, I've been primarily focused on uh, students' learning strategies and regulation of strategies in video-based learning. And actually, I would like to thank Negin for, you know, uh, drawing more attention to this highly in, uh, uh, interesting and highly relevant uh, area of learning analytics. And uh, also for a couple of years now, I've been studying it. Yeah, thanks. So just a bit of an outline of today's session. Um, We'll go over um, the what and why of video-based learning analytics and why it's a research field that um, we're engaged with and many others are engaged with. Some background um, and some relevant theories that um, largely underpin much of the work, not all the work, much of the work around video-based learning analytics that might be relevant to you. We'll explore some of the types of questions um, that video-based learning analytics could help answer. It's not an exhaustive list, but we'll definitely explore some of the recent studies um, and Yelena will be go giving quite a thorough overview of the methodologies in particular of recent studies in the space. And we'll go over some limitations and challenges um, towards the end and answer any questions that you have. So let's just start off by perhaps defining what we mean by video-based learning analytics. Um, just as we know about learning analytics, video-based learning analytics refers to the analysis of data that's captured from learners' engagement with videos in particular um, for the purpose of understanding the engagement patterns and the learning strategies and how video use contributes to learning. So this is the field um, that we're exploring in today's session. And um, we thought it'd be useful to just start off with a definition so we all understand where we're coming from. Now, why video-based learning analytics? Um, We'll come back to this because I want to go over a few things just before we talk about why. So we've, we've talked about what it is, but let's come back to this in, in a few slides. So let's explore the background. Now, as many of you 
would know, as I'm trying to, there we go. As many of you know, video is ubiquitous in education, particularly these days with um, post COVID, there's a lot more videos out there than there ever has been before. So COVID has, as it has, it's accelerated the use of video, whether that's video lectures, whether that's students' recordings of their own videos, it's video assessments, you name it. There's also a huge number of tools available and more accessible tools for creating videos. You can create it on your smartphone or your tablet. Um, you can create it using Zoom um, like we are today. This is gonna be another video artifact um, that's going to be out there, PowerPoint, etc. So it's a lot easier for people to now create videos and also stream it um, through the use of video platforms like Panopto or you know, taking a look at what's happened in MOOCs and LinkedIn Learning, Khan Academy all use a lot of videos. So with there being a lot of video, um, it's important to know how students are engaging with such video. So it's a resource like any other. Um, however, with it, because it's a digital resource, comes quite a bit of data. But um, these vid video that are coupled with how students are engaging, it's really important to then explore what is working, what is not, and why some students might engage with certain videos and others and their trajectories. So just a bit of background around how we came about looking at video-based learning analytics, largely because there's such a huge amount of video right now. There's also established learning strategies within video watching. We know that often video could be a passive learning experience, some might say, um, with the use of video annotations or in video questions or even note taking that students might do while watching a video. These are the types of strategies that students might use to make that learning experience a bit more um, active per se. Now, video-based learning analytics um, isn't particularly new. It actually dates back to 2011 um, at the very first learning analytics um, knowledge conference in Banff in 2011. Um, Chris Brooks uh, from um, currently, I think in Michigan, previously in Canada, um, did the, one of the very first learning analytics based um, video research. And he was particularly looking at lecture capture recordings um, at that time, very common. Um, but it's important to know that was one of the very first um, studies around video based learning analytics. And he was very much looking at clustering of students um, based on their interaction with the video lectures across a semester. Um, and that was presented at, at the first learning analytics conference. Now, since then, um, a few years later, um, with the advent of MOOCs, um, a seminal paper came out by Gro and colleagues in 2014 on the use of video engagement in MOOCs. And it's a very highly cited um, finding related to video design, particularly looking at the length of videos and what might be the ideal length, at what point do students perhaps lose interest in watching a video. Um, so both the, the first one by Chris being an early one, but Guo's paper um, is a seminal piece as well that I thought was worthwhile to mention. Now, all the papers that we mention in today's session are in the references at the end of uh, today's presentation. So let's just think about theory just for a second, because theory is important um, in terms of how we underpin the research that we're looking at and how we underpin the research questions that we devise and subsequently the methodology that we use. So one of uh, the theories that's often used around video based learning is uh, multimedia learning theory, which is based off of cognitive load theory. Uh, multimedia learning theory devised by Richard Mayer um, has essentially 12 key principles around effective multimedia design. However, there's certain principles that are more related to video use in particular. Um, I'm just gonna go over just a few of them in terms of their relevance to studies that have come out. So learners um, can control when they're watching a video, when they pause and rewind, unlike when they're in the lecture or in a tutorial. And that regulation of the load on their working memory is one of the aspects around cognitive load theory in terms of how much load is on someone's memory and as well as multimedia learning theory. The second is around short video clips. Now, in Gros' early study in 2014, he, it also came out that short clips, ideally around that nine, seven to nine minute length are ideal. 
But with looking at Mayer's work around multimedia learning theory, he's very much saying it's that segmenting principle. So short clips, the segmentation of it underpins um, how students engage with those shorter videos. Now, editing videos to include relevant information only, reducing that extraneous load, um, is what's called coherence principle um, based off of Mayer's work. And it's very much in terms of just putting on what is critical for students to watch on the screen, for example, and not adding in extra images or animations that have no purpose. And highlighting information, um, like on a lecture slide where you might circle something or you might um, highlight a, a particular piece of text refers to the signaling principle, which is um, again, one of the multimedia learning principles underpinned by Mayer's work. And now I'm just gonna to jump to self located learning theory as a lot of studies also, um, rather than looking at multimedia per se, are also looking at the learning strategies that students use, the motivations that they might have, and their self-efficacy around the use of videos. Um, so with SRL as a, the short form of self located learning theory, um, learners are monitoring their progress and their understanding and regulating their learning strategies. So when it comes to using video, it's that whole notion of, when students go and rewind a particular part of a video, perhaps to go back and watch, um, which videos do they even choose to rewatch again? Which videos do they select to look at? Um, is also part of those learning strategies that they explore, and whether it's the motivations behind them or whether it's um, the use of that information and the learning strategies that they think would be useful for their own understanding. For example, they finding it particularly useful and they might go and find other videos elsewhere. Um, to support their learning, or they might choose to take notes while watching a video, or they might not bother taking notes because they know they can rewind to certain sections. Um, so it's those different types of learning strategies that they use that's underpinned by SRL. There's also the self-efficacy or the confidence when learning new information um, that's underpinned by it. So when some videos that you might have seen um, have pauses in them, pop-up questions that appear. Um, research has shown that those, those pop-up questions do promote self-efficacy um, and they also help highlight the important parts for students. So students who might not have the prior knowledge, who might be new to a topic, um, seeing those pop-up questions um, would be able to quickly identify the particular areas of the video that are perhaps more important than others or when they answer those questions and they find them difficult, they know they need to go and return to that piece of um, content in the video. And as well, there's intrinsic motivational drivers and goal setting. However, um, we do know that those are often difficult to capture um, straight from the data and we'll explore that and some of the limitations later. So now let's go back to why video-based learning analytics is even something to explore. So like I said, there's lots of video, which means we have lots of data. Um, and we have easier access to that data now compared to before. So now that we have that data, it might be useful to explore how um, students are engaging with these resources. Now by engaging and um, researching that data, we can identify patterns in students' learning strategy, the engagement, the behavior, and this is using the objective data from the video. So rather than asking students how they use the video or their perceived satisfaction from the video or even their perceived usefulness of the video, be relying on them remembering which parts of the video they watched or relying on them remembering how the video was useful in their learning, we can use the objective data straight from the videos. And we can aggregate that with other data to develop learner profiles, whether that's aggregating it with um, the other learning analytics data from their courses, their online activities they might be engaging with, maybe it's their assessment data, maybe it's their demographic data. So a range of other data that we, as um, many in the learning analytics community know we have access to, um, aggregating that with the video data can give us a more holistic um, profile of learners in terms of those who, um, might be um, cramming all those video content together um, or might be watching video strategically across the study period and um, depending on when assessment deadlines are due, etc. And all these different types of data um, can help us answer a range of questions. So in the next series of slides, I'm just going to go over some of the research questions um, that the most recent papers um, have been trying to answer using video-based learning analytics. So what we've got here, just a little table to show 
the data type, the questions, um, and the issues and considerations that we just have to think about um, with these types of questions. So um, I've included the citation for the research here. Now, Yelena is going to unpack some of this um, in a moment. And as I said, you'll have the full reference to these papers at the end of the slide. Um, one of the most popular um, is the clickstream video data. It's that play, pause, rewind, fast forward, um, which a lot of studies have looked at. Um, Guo, for example, like I said, was looking at how much of a video students watched and at what point um, the timeline, um, it was getting too long or too short. Um, earlier, more, sorry, more recent papers now are looking at why students are pausing in a video. So not so much about the length of the video so much, but now what, when do they pause and why do they pause? Um, uh, other studies are looking at the learning context in terms of the time in the semester. When are those assessment deadlines? When are those exams? And what does that mean in terms of of students' behavior in terms of watching videos. Other studies are looking at um, how using this um, clickstream data really can reveal the SRL strategies and the relationship to learning outcomes or learning goals even. Now, of course, that's all relevant to or related to whether you have access to this data. Um, the particular play, pause, rewind, fast forward is not always as accessible as one may hope. In terms of having it, we often know how much of a video someone's watched, but we might not necessarily know if they've rewound or how we can tell that or fast forwarded. So it all depends on what level of data someone might have access to. And of course, knowing um, the content of the video is often useful to know. Um, what is the type of video? What are the difficult segments from the pedagogical point of view? Um, what are students' goals and intents? So oftentimes it's not just about the data, um, from the video platform that we use, it's we need a lot more in order to be able to understand and make meaning out of the data. So video length, as I mentioned, is an important one that many people have looked at, watching and re-watching, and the playback speed is another one that studies have looked at in terms of the playback speed of videos and what might be ideal, as well as um, what types of video students pay most attention to, or the order of what students might be looking at. So that's where we need to know the video types um, there's different genres of videos um, and the presentation styles and videos. Is it a talking head? Is it PowerPoint and audio? Um, is the lecture in the video or not? Is it um, a conversation piece in the video? So that knowing the genres and the topic of videos is critical um, to be able to make sense of the data and the analysis from the data. Um, and yeah, one of the studies, um, Belang and all recently has looked at the playback speed and how that relates to learning outcomes again whether you have access to that playback speed is another question. And as I said, there's um, other data um, that we can look at. There's video annotation data, if that's something that is used using a video annotation tool, for example, or even something like, um, I know at UniSA, our video streaming platform has um, annotation capability that can go in it. Um, there's different tools out there that can do that. If you've got access to that information, that might give further insight into the learning strategies students may use or may not use with videos. Um, recent studies have also started looking at eye tracking um, in terms of to what extent students are following dialogue or gestures in the video um, and how that might relate to their learning outcomes. Um, Challenges with eye tracking is that we do typically have lower number of participants in the study, um, as they tend to be more experimental studies with eye tracking devices. And as well as looking at video recommendation systems um, and how we can better predict what video students should be looking at um, and being able to recommend them. So that's just an overview of um, the types of questions uh, that recent studies have been exploring. So let's just look at the so what of all this. Um, why bother doing this? Like I said, learner profiles, and we couple them with predictive algorithms. We can help identify when to nudge students, when to give feedback to students on their student engagement. Um, if we have a good understanding of their learning trajectory through their learning profile, we might see that all certain groups, clusters of students might not be watching the videos that are related to a particular assessment coming up and might need to have a nudge, for example. Um, and patterns of engagement can be shared back to students so they can see their own analytics, or it could be even used as simulated recall for further research. 
Um, so research, if it's exploring, whether um, really trying to understand why students might watch a video um, or might re-watch a video, in fact, why they replay certain parts, um, showing the analytics back to students might be a way for them to then be able to say, oh, yeah, I think I was looking at that part of the video twice because I wasn't paying attention the first time, the phone rang, I was distracted, or I actually didn't, the reason is I didn't understand it, I have to watch it three or four times to fully understand it. And so sharing those analytics back to them might be a way to better have them simulate their recall for that type of research. But even showing them the analytics is a way for them to also see, well, how much of the video have I, I thought I watched all of it, but really I haven't. Or why did I go back and watch these videos so many times and not others? So sometimes that can be um, useful. For students to be able to see that as well. And further, the findings can support future video design, pedagogical approaches. We know um, many of our lecturers, uh, many of our teachers, and regardless of the education sector, are spending a lot of time, a lot of effort creating videos as it is becoming the norm and a very common resource. Uh, however, without knowing how to best design them or how to best integrate them in the curriculum through the pedagogical approaches. Um, all we're doing is creating lots of videos and students might not be engaging with them. We don't know, you know, some studies are saying the in-video pop-up questions are helpful. Other studies we still have to explore. Um, Note-taking, for example, is that something that we need to be promoting more or not and in what context? So there's all range of pedagogical questions that we still don't know the answer to. We still aren't very um, across when to be nudging certain students and when not to be nudging certain students. There's a plethora of research that has happened. Um, however, a plethora of research that still continues to happen in order to be able to support that future video design and pedagogical approaches. So after this background and lots of um, types of research questions, um, I'm going to hand over to Yelena, who's going to talk about the distinct methodologies um, in the different studies that you briefly saw on those tables. So I will stop my screen share and pass it over. Okay, thanks, Negan. Uh, just a second to share my screen. Okay. So yeah, I hope uh, that you're seeing the slides now. Okay, uh, so yeah, hello again. And uh, let's uh, now move uh, to methodologies that were used to address the research questions that Nagy has been talking about. But uh, before starting with that, let me just quickly say that uh, this part is not intended to be an exhaustive overview of methodologies applied in recent video analytics research, nor an exhaustive presentation of individual methods, that is methods adopted in individual studies. Uh, instead, our intention uh, is to give you an overview of different methods, of a diversity of methods that have been recently used in video analytics research, so that you get a glimpse into a variety of ways that uh, video-based learning has been uh, recently studied. And uh, to that end, uh, we intentionally pick studies that are quite uh, different uh, in the methods that they adopted to address their research questions. And also for the sake of time, we will limit our presentation to the methods themselves. So without going uh, into the study findings, at least not in detail. But uh, as Negan said, uh, for all studies that we mentioned uh, within this uh, tutorial, we include references at the end of the slide deck so that you can examine those that uh, attract your attention. Okay, uh, so let's start with, um, uh, with the first uh, study. Uh, it is a study, a recent study by Merck and colleagues, which was driven by the objective to identify the reasons for pausing uh, within course videos. So when and why students uh, paused within uh, course videos. And uh, while in general, this is quite interesting study, uh, what I found particularly interesting and wanted to share with you regarding their methodology is that uh, they demonstrated uh, how data from distinct data sources, but about the same videos, uh, can be combined uh, to explain uh, learning behavior, in this particular case, uh, pausing within videos. And uh, more precisely, they combine data uh, from three distinct data sources, as I said, about the same videos. So the first uh, were log files uh, of the video platform, uh, which were used, of course, to identify positions at which the videos were posed by the learners. Uh, then uh, data collected in a laboratory study uh, where the students uh, uh, watched the same videos, and then they were asked to identify meaningful boundaries within those videos 
as well as segments of the videos that were difficult for them uh, to comprehend. And the third source uh, was uh, the output of a computer vision algorithm, which was used to identify structural breakpoints or cuts uh, within uh, those uh, same videos. And uh, with all the uh, data, uh, let's say, collected and combined, uh, they did regression analysis. And uh, for the analysis, uh, videos were split uh, into one second long uh, bins. And uh, for those bin they, bins, uh, they computed uh, several, let's say, variables or features. Uh, they computed a number of poses per bin, and uh, this served uh, as the dependent or outcome variable in regression analysis, so some, something that they wanted to predict. And uh, as independent variables or features or predictors, uh, they used uh, the number of students who posed, again, at the level of individual bins, then the number of students who noted the difficulty, the number of them who noted a meaningful boundary. So the last two things uh, come from that uh, uh, study. Um, and uh, uh, also uh, whether there was a structural breakpoint uh, or cut uh, within a video as recognized by uh, uh, that algorithm. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you're interested uh, in uh, learning which of these uh, actually predictors uh, was uh, the most relevant for predicting the number of pauses per bin and answering the question why students pause, then I suggest you take a look at the paper. And we are moving uh, to the next uh, study, uh, which was a study, recent study by C and colleagues, uh, uh, where they wanted to examine uh, how learning context uh, impacts uh, video engagement goals. Uh, and to that end, uh, they actually conducted uh, two uh, studies, uh, one after the other. So the first one uh, had as its objective uh, to identify students' uh, video engagement goals. And uh, then in the second one, after identifying those goals, they wanted uh, to identify the impact of uh, learning context on uh, those engagement goals. And uh, I'll say a few words uh, about uh, each of these uh, uh, studies. So as I said, the objective of the first one uh, was uh, to identify students' uh, video engagement goals and then to map those goals uh, to distinct uh, video activities. And uh, to that end, uh, students were asked to associate uh, each video activity supported by the video platform uh, with their intention for taking that activity. And in that way, uh, the researchers collected a large number of activity intention pairs uh, which then uh, they analyzed uh, using affinity diagramming, uh, which is a technique uh, for organizing and grouping ideas in order to discover common themes. And in that way, uh, they um, um, derived from those uh, activity intention peers about a dozen of uh, engagement goals. And these engagement goals uh, served as uh, the input uh, to one of the inputs uh, to the next study. So as I said, the next study, the second one was uh, aimed at examining the impact of learning context on those engagement goals uh, identified in the first study. And uh, to that end, uh, they used uh, multi-level linear models uh, to so estimate the effect of several context variables um, on engagement goals. And uh, even though they, uh, in the first study, they uh, identified uh, about a dozen of engagement goals, uh, in this one, they focused on a subset of those goals, uh, namely on four goals, reflect, uh, clarify, scheme, and search. Uh, since uh, these four were the most representative, that is those for which they had sufficient number of data points uh, to build uh, these uh, multi-level models. And so they built uh, one model for each of these goals. Uh, and uh, these, uh, then they examine context variables. Context variables uh, served actually as uh, fixed effects uh, in, uh, in these models. Uh, so they consider course week, uh, so which week of the course it was, uh, whether it was exam week or not, whether that was the first watching of the video or repeated watching of the video, and also what was the duration of the video. Uh, and uh, as random effects uh, in these uh, multi-level models, uh, so they had uh, they built three level models uh, and the nested uh, effects, random effects. Uh, so sessions nested within video and the video nested within student. Uh, and uh, yeah, I didn't say that uh, uh, both uh, context variables and uh, engagement goals, that is the number of activities associated with each engagement goal uh, were computed at the level of uh, session where session was uh, defined uh, as, uh, uh, let's say, 
um, unique combination of student, video, and date. In other words, uh, uh, a video that was watched by a student on a specific uh, day. And uh, yeah, as I said uh, for the previous study, if you're interested in learning uh, more about uh, their uh, method and uh, what did they found about the relevance of these context variables, I suggest looking at this highly interesting paper. And uh, we're moving uh, to the next study. This is a, a recent uh, study by Zhang and colleagues, which was published in Journal of Learning Analytics. Uh, and uh, they proposed uh, in, uh, in this uh, study, uh, let's say a graph-based approach to studying the dynamic of dynamics of students' interactions with learning resources in general and videos in particular. And uh, let's say their objective uh, here was uh, to uh, actually uh, associate, find associations uh, between uh, features of videos and um, uh, let's say attention uh, that uh, students' attention pay to those videos. So what are the features uh, of uh, videos that uh, attract and uh, keep, uh, let's say, students' uh, attention? Uh, and uh, to that end, as I said, that they proposed this uh, network-based approach, which is uh, where they built a kind of uh, attention flow network. And uh, the key concepts uh, of, um, let's say, uh, their overall approach and this network approach is accumulation, circulation, and dissipation of attention. And to uh, try to, uh, let's say, uh, explain this uh, briefly, uh, I took this uh, uh, figure from, from the paper. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, this is a network-based approach, uh, and in the network uh, nodes, in this case, are learning resources. So we have, uh, let's say, one and the other learning resource. They specifically focus on videos, but it is a kind of uh, general approach that can be applied to any other type of learning resource. And um, uh, edges within this network uh, actually represent uh, channels uh, for uh, attention circulation or attention flow. So we can see here that uh, attention is circulating, uh, um, I mean, across uh, these uh, two learning resources or two, these two videos, and everything uh, is happening within online learning space. Uh, but there is also a connection with offline learning space or face-to-face -face, uh, learning uh, with these, as they call them, artificial nodes, uh, source and sync. So uh, this uh, offline or face-to-face -face, uh, learning space is a kind of source of attention and attention accumulates uh, from there and goes into this online learning space. And eventually it uh, dissipates, goes out of this online learning space and goes back uh, to offline or face-to-face -face, uh, learning space. And uh, this is actually, it was also needed uh, to uh, properly model the dynamics of open flow systems, uh, which are actually based on general and based on flow of energy, but in this case, they focus it on the flow of uh, attention. And so when uh, these concepts of uh, accumulation, circulation, and dissipation of attention uh, are applied uh, to uh, one particular course that uh, relies on uh, video uh, lectures, uh, then we get uh, this kind of, uh, okay, let's say, cumulative uh, uh, attention flow network. So this is, again, a, a figure taken from the paper, uh, which uh, depicts uh, this uh, network built uh, for the course uh, that uh, constituted the setting uh, of the study. Uh, so the nodes uh, here are video lectures. Uh, the colors of nodes uh, denote uh, the module that uh, each uh, video lecture belongs to, uh, whereas uh, the size of the node represents uh, the total amount of uh, attention flow that uh, goes through that node. And uh, you may also observe that uh, different uh, thickness of the edges that uh, connect these nodes. And uh, this uh, edge, edge thickness of edges actually corresponds to a measure which is called flow distance. And this flow distance is a, a probability that uh, a learner, uh, after interacting, watching uh, video A, or let's say any video, uh, accesses another video, let's say video B, for the first time after any number of steps. Or if we express it in the terms of um, if network in network terms, then you would say that this uh, flow distance reflects the average number of steps that are required for attention flow to circulate from one learning resource, let's say video A, to another learning resource, so video B. And this flow distance is uh, calculated uh, using uh, clickstream data. And uh, 
the att these uh, attention flows uh, and the flow distances are computed first at the level of individual study sessions, and then they're aggregated uh, into this kind of uh, cumulative uh, attention flow network. Uh, and uh, with such a network uh, set, uh, they um, then wanted, as I said, uh, to identify uh, characteristics of videos that uh, students pay most attention to. And to that end, uh, they computed correlations uh, between uh, distinct uh, video features, um, that is features of video lectures, such as uh, the length uh, of videos, uh, presentation type, type of instruction, so on. On one hand, and the other hand, um, uh, measures uh, of collective attention allocation to the corresponding video lectures. So this uh, accumulation, circulation, and dissipation of attention. So a quite uh, interesting study and quite a uh, unique uh, uh, approach uh, to uh, studying this topic. Okay, uh, so the next uh, study that uh, I would like to mention was actually uh, led by Negin a few years ago. And uh, the focus um, and the objective was uh, to uh, identify uh, learning strategies and uh, the ways uh, you, uh, students uh, use those strategies uh, in a video-based learning course. Uh, in uh, this course, uh, students uh, had, um, uh, let's say, this uh, oval tool, which is a video, let's say, based pl video platform that uh, supports not only uh, let's say some typical kinds of interactions like with videos like play, pause, rewind, and so on, but also allows um, more active engagement uh, with videos uh, through different kinds of uh, annotations. And um, to study uh, students' um, uh, students' learning strategies uh, and the use of those strategies within this uh, context. Uh, we applied actually three stage uh, uh, or what's the analytical method or, uh, that consisted of uh, three steps. Uh, so the objective of the first one uh, was uh, to uh, identify patterns uh, in uh, learners interaction with course videos that would be then interpreted, that, that could be interpreted uh, as uh, manifestations of the adopted learning strategies. And uh, this was done uh, at the level of uh, individual modules. So there were five modules uh, within the course. And after identifying uh, those um, strategies uh, for, uh, for each individual module, uh, the, the second step, the objective was uh, to uh, identify patterns uh, in how learners use strategies uh, throughout the course that is across those modules. And uh, to detect something that we refer to as strategy trajectories, or let's say typical sequences of strategies uh, within uh, the course. And uh, the third step uh, was uh, looking uh, into the dynamics of strategy use across modules. Uh, so the idea was uh, to see if we would be able to predict with certain probability uh, that after uh, using one strategy in one module, the learner were, would keep, keep the same strategy in the next module or, or would uh, change uh, transition to another strategy in the next module. And I'll say a few words about uh, uh, each of these uh, three stages. Uh, so as, uh, as I said, uh, the, the objective of the first one uh, was uh, to identify, uh, let's say, patterns in students' interactions with videos uh, that could be interpreted as manifestations of module-level strategies. And uh, to that end, uh, we actually uh, clustered uh, cluster learners based on, uh, on the features uh, characterizing uh, their interactions with videos. Uh, as for the method, the agglomerated hierarchical clustering was used since uh, that was a clustering method that uh, had already proven uh, effective uh, in identifying the students' profiles based on their interactions with different kinds of uh, learning resources. Uh, and uh, as for features, uh, we used uh, several, about a dozen of features or more, uh, specifically uh, a set of features uh, indicating the intensity or extent uh, of use of different uh, video related activities, such as particular counts of, let's say, play, pause, rewind, uh, and so on actions, uh, the counts of um, annotations created, edited, and so on. Uh, then a set of features uh, indicating uh, when and to what extent students uh, engaged with video annotations. Um, this, would, uh, this included uh, the number of videos uh, that uh, were annotated, uh, the number of them that were annotated uh, right before the deadline, the number of them that were annotated right after they were released, uh, and so on. 
And there was a feature indicating uh, the extent to which uh, uh, learner combined the different kinds of uh, video activities when interacting with the same video, uh, which was uh, computed as uh, the density of uh, activity transition and graph. And uh, uh, in this way, uh, we uh, actually did a clustering uh, uh, for each module, as I said, there were five modules. And uh, for each of those five modules and each, each student, we identified um, a cluster assignment that is uh, this, um, uh, let's say, strategy. I mean, clusters were interpreted uh, based uh, on the features they were characterized with and uh, accordingly labeled uh, and interpreted as uh, learning strategies. And um, uh, then I mean, those strategies uh, identify the module level. In the next step, uh, we use latent class analysis or L LCA uh, to now identify patterns uh, in, uh, in the way that uh, students uh, use strategies. Uh, LCA is uh, actually, again, a clustering method, but it's a soft clustering method, meaning that uh, it, uh, it would associate uh, each student with each strategy trajectory with a certain uh, probability. Um, and uh, in this way, with these two stages, we were actually uh, able to, uh, let's say, understand uh, how students uh, interacted uh, with videos, so what kind of strategies they used, and um, uh, not only one module, but across the modules, but we were not able to uh, make any predictions regarding uh, what strategy uh, a learner would use uh, in the next module after using, let's say, some other strategy in, uh, in the previous module. Uh, so to be able to do that, uh, uh, we in the first uh, step uh, model the dynamics of strategy use uh, using a hidden Markov model. So hidden Markov model actually identifies uh, those uh, latent uh, states or hidden states, as they're called here, uh, which um, uh, which in our interpretation uh, would uh, correspond uh, to uh, uh, correspond uh, to uh, learning strategies. Uh, and it also uh, computes, I mean, as one of its output, it produces a transition matrix that is, a, a, let's say, matrix of transition probabilities uh, between uh, any pair of uh, hidden states, that is, in this context, in between any pair of uh, learning strategies. And uh, since uh, we wanted uh, to, let's say, identify uh, latent constructs, if not identical, then uh, corresponding to those that uh, we identified in the third step as uh, learning strategies, uh, we use uh, the same set of features, um, actually just uh, somewhat uh, transformed uh, features so that they can be used uh, with, uh, with the algorithm here. Um, and uh, as uh, for determining the number of uh, uh, states, so I mean these hidden states or uh, latent constructs or strategies, uh, we relied on the, the recurrent number of strategies in the, identified in the step one. Uh, so, yeah, it was a, a quite a comprehensive uh, methodology. And um, yeah, if, if any questions, uh, anything uh, that remained uh, unclear, just uh, please let me know afterwards or uh, more details are in the paper. Okay, uh, the, the next study uh, that uh, I would mention is a study that uh, explored the use of uh, nudges uh, to encourage uh, students uh, to write uh, high, quality, uh, high quality comments. And uh, it was a recently published uh, study led by Mohammedson. And uh, this uh, study actually uh, was motivated by the author's earlier work uh, where they uh, show that uh, students uh, who wrote uh, comments, especially high quality comments, uh, learn more. So they now wanted to see uh, how through nudges uh, they could uh, encourage students uh, to write more such high quality comments. And uh, this study relied uh, on the AVW Space video platform, uh, which uh, was developed and continuously enhanced in the author's earlier work. Uh, more precisely, uh, it has been uh, in a continuous uh, development improvement by, uh, let's say, research group or research uh, team gathered around uh, Vanya Mitrova and uh, Tanya Mitrovic. Vanya Dimitrova and Tanya Mitrovic, sorry. Uh, and um, yes, uh, in addition to typical video-based uh, learning activities, um, uh, the platform uh, supports and encourages students uh, to engage uh, in uh, uh, engage with videos uh, through different kinds of scaffolds. Uh, so personalized prompts, video learning analytics, uh, visual learning analytics, and so on. Uh, and for this particular study, uh, this uh, AVW space platform was uh, further enhanced uh, with a classifier. 
uh, that uh, the purpose of which uh, is uh, to uh, automatically, so in real time, to assess uh, the quality of comments, uh, so to assess them as students write those comments. And uh, also the Nudge engine, which was already present uh, in the platform, was further extended uh, to um, to con uh, consider this uh, input from the classifier when uh, determining uh, what nudge and when uh, to present uh, to a learner to provoke uh, reflection videos. Uh, so, for example, if uh, a command that student has just posted uh, is predicted by the classifier as being of low quality, then uh, the elaborate nudge would be activated to motivate student uh, to write longer and better quality comments. And this is just one simple example. They have uh, far more sophisticated uh, nudges uh, and conditions for activating them that you can see uh, read in the paper. Uh, I will focus uh, on uh, the classifier and say a, a few words about it. Uh, so this classifier, as I said, uh, was aimed at uh, assessing students' uh, commands uh, in uh, real time. Uh, that is associated each command uh, with the quality category. And these quality categories uh, were defined uh, by the authors uh, based on the analysis of the students' commands collected in their earlier studies. Uh, so they defined uh, categories such as uh, off-topic, repetitive, critical, analytical, self-reflection, self-regulation, and so on. Uh, and uh, as uh, for the input uh, to the classifier, they uh, use uh, two kinds of features. Uh, so they use uh, these look features, linguistic inquiry and word count features. Uh, on one hand, on the other hand, uh, domain specific features. So look uh, features um, actually consist of a broad set of uh, linguistic and psychological features, um, which are actually based on word counts and have been used in several learning analytics studies uh, to uh, analyze reflective uh, writing. And uh, they are, let's say, domain uh, independent. On the other hand, uh, we have here, uh, let's say, another group of features, which are domain, uh, domain dependent, uh, based on domain uh, specific vocabulary, uh, again, derived from uh, the, the author's uh, earlier work. As uh, the algorithm uh, for uh, classification, they use random forest, uh, so an algorithm that is uh, often used in, in learning analytics uh, for classification purposes. But what is particularly interesting here is that they use this cost-sensitive version of a random forest, uh, meaning that uh, they recognize that uh, not all misclassifications would be of same, same relevance and uh, fr from a pedagogical perspective. And uh, therefore, uh, they wanted to instruct the, the algorithm to uh, make uh, less, let's say, mistakes uh, that would be more costly that, from this pedagogical perspective. Um, yeah, let me just also say that um, uh, with this um, uh, classifier uh, producing, let's say, quality, uh, I mean, determining the quality of commands, um, the, its uh, output serve as the input uh, for, uh, for the Nudge engine. In addition to, to this um, uh, quality of command, uh, uh, the Nudge engine also considers the student profile, which is uh, maintained uh, by the platform, also the history of nudges the student have all, has already received for the current video, as well as uh, time uh, in the video that the student uh, is currently in. And so, for example, if a student uh, is watching the last 30 seconds of a video and uh, has not written any high quality comment yet uh, about that video, then the nudge, uh, a nudge would be uh, presented uh, to encourage the student uh, to write self-reflections after watching the video. And as I said, uh, there are uh, many more nudges that they introduced. Okay, oh, sorry, I already switched to another. Yeah, so the last study that uh, I would uh, mention is, um, again, a recent study by Shostow and colleagues uh, that uh, was looking into how students uh, follow the instructor's discourse uh, in a video lecture. And uh, the study relied on, uh, relied on uh, students' uh, eye gaze, that is eye gaze data collected uh, about uh, while students were watching the video lecture. Uh, and. Uh, the method uh, builds uh, on the concept of uh, student-teacher co-attention in uh, video-based learning and uh, eye-tracking measure of conceptual widminess, uh, which was uh, originally um, proposed uh, by Sharm and colleagues in 2014. And uh, it represents uh, the amount of time that a learner followed uh, the instructor's discourse. And uh, in this uh, current study, uh, so the one by Shostow and colleagues, uh, they uh, actually 
um, proposed the extension of this uh, conceptual with Minas uh, to include also the direction of the student's case. Um, and uh, they named uh, this uh, new proposed measure as uh, with Minas direction. So it includes this temporal aspect, meaning how long the student is focused on a particular area of interest, but also the direction of the student's gaze. So is it the same area of interest as the teacher uh, is talking about, or is it ahead or behind or completely outside this active area of interest? And this is a figure that I took uh, from the paper just uh, to clarify about uh, this uh, direction and about the areas of interest. Uh, so this is actually a part of the slide that uh, uh, would be presented uh, within a video lecture that the teacher is talking about. And uh, we see that the segment of this slide uh, would be actually uh, labeled as active area, as area of interest and would be active area of interest, meaning that the teacher is currently talking about it. Uh, and uh, we see these blue, blue dots uh, actually representing uh, where the student is watching, uh, looking at, so fix, students fixations. And uh, these here would be uh, same as the teacher, uh, whereas these, for example, would be outside of active area of interest. And uh, as in any uh, analytics or video analytics, uh, um, a lot of uh, data preparation and pre-processing has to be done. Uh, but uh, in this case, when working uh, with uh, eye gaze uh, data um, and uh, videos uh, together with eye gaze data, uh, even more, uh, let's say, data preparation and wrangling uh, had to be done. So I just uh, wanted uh, to mention uh, some of those uh, steps uh, just to, you know, uh, you get an idea of uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, of the kinds of work and amount of work that uh, has to be done to prepare uh, data for subsequent analysis. So they had to uh, first manually segment uh, the slides, those slides presented with videos uh, into areas of interest, active area of interest. Um, and um, then uh, they had to uh, do the manual mapping of, uh, uh, let's say, tra transcribe the teacher's narration or voice segments uh, to the corresponding areas of interest. Uh, so that uh, we have that there is this uh, connection between, uh, let's say, what the teacher is talking about and uh, what is uh, currently presented within a, within a video as an uh, active area of interest. And with that, they created uh, this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, data set. Again, a picture, figure taken from the paper. Uh, so uh, for each uh, segment uh, of uh, the, the narration, the teacher's narration, there would be uh, timestamps, start and end, uh, uh, what was uh, said uh, during that uh, time, time period, with which area of interest it refers to, what slide uh, it belongs to. And also they had to uh, identify students' uh, fixations, so what the students were looking at uh, from the data set, set of uh, timestamp gaze coordinates so that they could uh, connect uh, students, uh, let's say, fixations with those um, uh, areas uh, of uh, interest. And uh, with uh, all that uh, data preparation and wrangling uh, done, uh, they uh, were able to uh, answer, uh, they had uh, three or four research questions. Uh, and But uh, I will focus uh, uh, here only on this one about uh, uh, how students uh, follow the instructor's discourse in the lecture. Uh, and uh, to that end, uh, the authors investigated uh, if and how uh, high and low achieving students uh, differed uh, in the sequences uh, of uh, different uh, Vidminas directions. Uh, so uh, they actually uh, created for each uh, learner slide pair uh, phonologically ordered sequence uh, of all uh, with Mina's direction. So just to remind you, those would be same as uh, the teacher ahead, behind, or uh, outside. And uh, with uh, such uh, sequences uh, defined, uh, then uh, they um, uh, use those sequences as input uh, to discrete time marker chains. And uh, in that way, they um, uh, actually uh, got uh, transition matrices, uh, which were just uh, to give you an idea, had this kind of uh, depiction, and so or presentation, uh, where we have uh, we had matrix matrices uh, representing uh, probabilities of transitioning uh, between any pairs of these uh, different kinds of uh, directions, and then they would uh, compare and contrast that uh, for low achievers and uh, for high achievers. And um, again, I suggest you take a look uh, at the paper um, because there are really a lot of interesting things uh, presented there. Okay. Uh, Let's uh, go briefly through uh, limitations or better say gaps or challenges 
of uh, the current video analytics uh, methodology. So some things that uh, might give us uh, some ideas of where we want, uh, where we might want to go next uh, in terms of uh, studying for better studying and better understanding uh, video-based uh, learning. Uh, so the first thing that I would mention is that uh, interactions with videos uh, are often studied in isolation from other activities that students engaged in in a learning environment. Um, so in particular, in, in a large majority of studies, um, uh, the kinds of learning activities uh, that are considered are those that um, are re directly related uh, to the use of videos. Uh, however, within uh, any learning online or blend learning environment, uh, learners uh, are uh, also, uh, let's say, engaging in the other kinds of learning activities uh, that are related to videos, but not directly, meaning that, for example, uh, they would discuss videos within uh, discussion forums or chats, or they would um, uh, do some exercises or quizzes that are based on the videos that they watched and so on. So taking this, uh, let's say, broader uh, context of uh, learning activities uh, related to videos uh, could be uh, an interesting uh, uh, next area of work. Uh, then uh, video analytics uh, are often based on counts, um, whereas uh, the unfolding, temporal unfolding of uh, interactions uh, is uh, far less studied. Uh, in other words, uh, the dynamics uh, of students' interactions uh, has uh, not received uh, that much attention. There were studies like uh, the one that uh, I presented by Zhang and colleagues, uh, but um, it is, um, uh, let's say, not that, not that uh, let's say, represented as other kinds of uh, studies. And um, uh, also I mentioned that uh, the use of uh, log data alone uh, does not allow for capturing uh, intentions, students' intentions, objectives, rationales uh, for interacting with videos. Um, and this is important uh, because uh, the same logged actions uh, can serve different, sometimes uh, even opposing uh, engagement goals. Uh, for example, I can pause a video because uh, I want to go take a water, glass of water, or I pause a video because I wanted to reflect on what I just heard. Um, and um, so there is a need uh, for collecting data directly from students. And uh, as I, I mentioned, uh, there was uh, one study, uh, I mean, one of the studies that I mentioned, um, actually it was aimed at collecting data about the uh, student engagement, and that was fine, but uh, uh, the thing is uh, that the data uh, was collected uh, after students' interactions with, uh, with videos. So, uh, and we know that uh, those limitations uh, of uh, self-reports, uh, you know, after uh, learning has uh, happened. So it would be uh, better uh, if we would be able to collect data uh, in real time, so while the students uh, are interacting with videos, uh, through some forms of uh, microanalytic questions that uh, have already been used in learning analytics for in some other contexts. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so I think that uh, that would be uh, that would be all that uh, I wanted uh, to share at least for this moment. Uh, thank you. Stop sharing. Thank you very much, Yelena and Negan. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, and that was a, a great overview of the latest research in, in this area. Uh, it's particularly interesting to me as a teacher, because when I design course materials, I'm not too sure how long should the video be? Uh, when do I give feedback or, or a little nudge? So this, this was really um, inspiring and useful. And also as a researcher, um, you really showed us that it's powerful to um, combine different data sources and look at learners' intentions and their strategies to really get a better understanding of how students learn with videos. Um, I think I also have a better appreciation of the amount of work that uh, that is done when using eye tracking. <laughs> um, it's actually really huge. Um, but we can see that it's a very active field of research and there's still a lot that can be done um, in the future. So now I'd like to open the floor to uh, our participants and see if there are any questions from the audience. Feel free to just unmute yourself or type a, your question in the chat if it's easier. Hello. Hi. Hi, guys. Uh, first of all, let me just like say thank you for this wonderful whole, um, event you guys do. And then 
Um, I'm currently, I'm located in the United States, so it's quite, uh, it's a late night for me. So if my, I'm, I'm about to ask a question, but uh, it's already past my bedtime. So what if my question is really messy, just let me know. But uh, I really interest, I, 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 I came with a question because I'm not, um, I'm not like familiar with this learning analytic field. So, but I want to do something in this area. And then, so, and then I also think my research interest has something related to this learning analytic um, methods. So I just wanted to listen um, the what, how you guys think about as an expert. So one of the limitation um, um, you mentioned, uh, actually the first one, which is the inter interaction with videos are often studying isolation. And then that's exactly what my research is about. So I was looking at this video learning um, and the uh, instant common combination, how to utilize those things together to make the those students, those students um, particularly interested in is lurkers which is a student that doesn't really engage or participate in any comments, discussion board, but they are going to lurk on those things to learn through the, sort of like a self-regulate learning in other way. Like they just look at the, and then they get the knowledge and they are doing their own thing, but they're not like active or explicit, interact with other student or post or reply anything. So I was wondering, um, cause I trying to find some kind of article in this field, like in this session between this lurker, lurking behavior and the learning analytic. But uh, I, I don't know is that because my searching is wrong or something, but I couldn't find that much um, research. I guess my question for you guys is, um, do you see there's like any, like what kind of, what other learning analytic methods that are used to doing, helping students in this way? helping especially lurking behavior using in this video learning that are involved commenting, stuff like that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I don't know if that I make sense to my question. Yeah, um, I think the challenge with the lurkers is that the only data that's really gathered is from what they engage. So if they're not heavily engaged, there's a limitation of how much data there is. I guess the important question is then exploring, well, why are they lurking? Um, and what and how are they using that lurking behavior um, towards their learning? Which really you'd need to collect that information from the lur lurkers um, in a qualitative way in terms of actually asking them why they're behaving in such way or how are they finding their learning strategies? And if they then say, oh, I like to just passively watch it um, or kind of, lurk and you know watch a bit of it or maybe they fast forward or whatever they do as terms of their behavior so I think that is one of the limitations with the analytics around video is that it doesn't really give us the whole picture it doesn't really tell us what the why behind the activity so you might be able to see who is lurking in terms of their limited log data um, but it doesn't give us the why and that's the that's the struggle yeah um just um just uh, i just re recall this like things um i i wanted to talk about is that i i saw um so um let me just sort it out my 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 thoughts so here's the thing i i saw a lot of research which uh it's your research about um video annotation and some of the research about um how to like nudge the um helps help students to make better comments um and then all the students all the uh, some a bunch of uh, research in china they are doing like uh um they call like a dan, dan mu, which is uh, some kind of like a um it's like a flying comments fly through the video while they're watching as either on top of the video it's a bottom of the video um so i was wondering why it doesn't have this um this kind of video and the comments, just like the YouTube, that interface for students to use for a major learning platform, because that's exactly what my 
let's go back to my dissertation research, which is I'm currently doing, which is to explore the temporal contiguity that mayors, how this spatial attention split things. Because the, the common thing is a video is in the video session and then they have a discussion forum in other session, how they have to go back to there, but why it's not common to like using this in the one space. Well, I think um, that's why there are video annotation, video annotation tools out there. There's a number of them out there. Um, even common platforms like Panopto have a video annotation feature now where students can comment um, or flag parts of a video. It's, it's very similar whether you put text in or you flag it, kind of like when you bookmark something in a, in a book. Um, I suppose it's largely probably a pedagogical question more than anything in that either the teachers aren't aware of the advantages that this type of learning behavior could bring and the students aren't across it as well. Um, so one of our very, very early studies looking at this was having students um, annotate videos and they were graded on those annotations. Um, mm -hmm. And then moving forward to the following semester, they were no longer graded um, and to kind of see whether by grading it, they'd get some sort of extrinsic motivation to do it and whether they could then start to see the benefit of it so that when they move on to other courses and they're not graded, they continue to do it because they see it as a learning strategy. Um, and what we actually found was having it just in one course like that graded um, wasn't really enough for a sustained continuous use of that learning strategy. So I think the use of annotations or that flagging on a video is a new learning strategy for students and they're not fully across the benefit of it um, mm -hmm. compared to say maybe they watch a video and take notes or they feel they don't need to take notes because they know they can go back and rewind. Um, like when we're in a lecture, for example, and it's face to face, you might take notes because you know you can't go back and rewind it. But when you know there's a recording, maybe they choose not to. So I think it comes back to that pedagogical and also the motivation behind doing that. So whether it is building in actual activities and requirements for students to watch a video, make a certain number of annotations or flag important concepts um, for a reason so that they can start to realize that that is a learning strategy that they could use for their learning purposes. So I think that's why it's not commonly used. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, yeah let me just add uh, one thing if you're interested in this uh, commenting mm -hmm. uh, and how students uh, might be encouraged uh, to engage more. Uh, you might want to look uh, at this uh, work related to this AVW space uh, video platform, which I mentioned. Uh, since uh, they have uh, done a lot of work, uh, you know, trying uh, to add different kinds of, um, let's say, scaffolds uh, to, to motivate or to encourage students uh, to engage more in commenting using, I know, visual uh, learning analytics uh, to, let's say, signpost uh, the parts of videos that were uh, that attracted more, most atten more attention uh, from learners. Uh, then uh, to uh, help, then I think comment one 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 each other's uh, uh, comments and so on. So there were a couple of things that uh, quite interesting that they did. Uh, so that you might want mm -hmm. to take a look for that part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I kind of like the uh, um uh have the their research at uh, the reference. Yeah, I I think that that's most close to what I would want to do. Yeah. But uh, I, I guess it's just, um, I, I don't want to use all the, the time. Maybe I'll let the people talk and then I would just like wrestle with my own idea and then see if I can come up with the other good question to talk. Thank you though. Um, I just posted a, a reference in the chat for you that is about private shared annotations and lurking. Okay, okay thank you. To quickly add to the uh, comment and annotation features, I also might want to consider that not all video management platforms, not all video platforms, which are separate from the learning management system, even offer the possibility of doing so. We here have Panopto, which does that, and I think the Panopto and Cultura are the leaders on the market, as far as I know. And I think Cultura does as well, but 
talk about home pool also quite expensive and the less expensive ones as far as I know don't oft, don't all have even the possibility to comment on a video or to make annotations. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, one point of curiosity is, first of all, thank you very much. It was very helpful that you got an overview of the field. Some of the papers I had already read. And one question that always comes to my mind when I read this is you said that often these studies are based on count data. And often that's the case of counts of actually having watched a video without further differentiation if they have watched parts of the video or the whole video. And I wonder if you might know of a work that's actually considered which parts of the video students watched and if they watched certain parts multiple times or not. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand this part. Uh, you said that did they, did the, has it been examined if students uh, watch certain parts or? Can you I was wondering if there's a work in the field that's not only counts if a video has been watched, but also checks which part of this video has been watched. So for example, did they watch from minute 10 to 20 and then go back and two weeks later mm -hmm. and watch again those two minutes? Or when I came back two weeks later, did I watch minute 20 to 30? So basically picked up where I left off. Because that makes a difference in how to interpret this behavior. I think uh, yeah. there was. Um, I do remember seeing something that looked at video quartiles. Um, so they were looking, you know, the first quarter and, and so forth in the videos to look at the, the patterns of activity and at which point, um, which, which point students might drop and, and no longer watch the video, for example. I just have to think of which study it was that did that. It was a, it was a while ago. I don't know if you want to remember anything. Yeah, I'm not aware of it. Um, uh, I know that I remember the study where they looked into, they, let's say they created, looked into very short videos. So for just a couple of minutes long, and then uh, each video was, um, uh, let's say, annotated in terms, I mean, had its, as its metadata. So what purpose is served from, you know, pedagogical perspective. And then they looked into whether it was uh, introductory, whether it was, uh, I know summarization of what has been said, whether it was, uh, uh, I know, elaboration of, um, of, the, of the topic and things like that. Uh, and then they watched and they, exa um, I mean, examined, uh, so which of these uh, videos uh, from looking from this pedagogical perspective were, you know, watched the most, uh, rewounded the most uh, and so on. So, but not, uh, I cannot recall a uh, study where they actually looked into segmenting videos uh, and then looking into their parts and how the interaction of those parts. Yeah, it's a good yeah. question. I can't remember if it was possibly a research question we wanted to explore at one time, and maybe that's what I'm thinking of, um, mm -hmm. around those quartiles. Um, but yeah, if I can, if I think of what study I remember seeing around that, I feel like if it was from a while ago, um, yeah, I'll let you know. Great. Thank you very much. Although, I mean, I also do have to admit doing that would be quite difficult, especially getting the data in the beginning and then making sense of it. Well, in a way, because if, you, if we know, um, if we've got data of how much they've watched it, like where um, they like they paused or stopped, then you can kind of see how much of it they've watched. And if you can break down the length of a video into quartiles, then you could see um, at what point they stopped watching. Yep. If I think of it, I'll let you know. Thank you. All right, any final question? Okay, well, I think I'm gonna thank the presenters again. So thank you, Negan and Elena for this great presentation.
Uh, thank you for joining. Um, I know it's either very early or very late <laughs> where you are, so I wish you a lovely day, night, or evening, and thank you for joining. Thank you. Thanks thank you. Again.